today I wanted to do a video that's a little off subject to what I've been doing but I have been keeping an eye on Max Egan he was the one that started it all for me with Nightcap on Minjimble so and he is a member so I do keep an eye on him and I'd noticed that he said that he was doing two documentaries that he was working on one for the New Zealand shooting and one for the Port Arthur massacre. And when he said it, I thought, why would you do that? If not but to create fear and drum home some sort of an agenda. And, yeah, well, I believe there would be some political agenda behind it because these sovereignty extremists like Max Egan, they hold extremist political views and a large part of what they talk about is actually political because they're trying to get you to turn against the government. It's actually very political what they do. Now after he mentioned it again, I thought, well, he's not going to give up on this and he's determined to stir the fear up in people and plus you know the Port Arthur massacre has been long claimed as the reason why Australians were disarmed and we're now helpless because we're disarmed all right we're not helpless because we're disarmed I'm so over people thinking that the only defense the only power that you have in this world is behind a gun that's that's really low thinking and that kind of thinking is going to bring against you the kind of same base response live by the gun die by the gun so then I discovered that Ricardo Bosi of Australia One Party was also bringing up the Port Arthur massacre and it made sense to me ah so it is a political tool they're going to use a lot of that platform to try and bring people on side to the Australia One Party who is recommending that you sign up to the Aussie Patriots role for the lawful rebellion. They want people, they need numbers, they need a percentage and then they're going to claim lawful rebellion. They're going to essentially overthrow the government. Now back in, I think it was September last year, Max Egan started promoting Ricardo Bosi. And they have clearly had some association with each other since. And Max Egan tends to support what Ricardo Bosi is trying to achieve. Even though he would maintain his independence why is Max Egan doing a video on the Port Arthur massacre and the New Zealand shootings? He's doing documentaries like he did 9-11. So hopefully that will make him all big and famous again, you know, because he's going to be exposing the big secrets and revealing the truth and telling people to wake up because he's telling the truth. Well, the, the biggest problem I've got with someone that claims to be telling the truth and is so upfront and honest like Max Egan pretends to be is that he lives his life as a fake character. He doesn't even own his own identity, his own self. He has all the classic traits of an undercover. He has got a manufactured name and a manufactured identity to protect the real name and the real identity. I don't trust someone that can't represent themselves. If they've got to hide behind a pen name for the protection and safety of their own well-being, <laughs> uh, from what? Yeah, we've all, I've already been through those things before anyway, but he keeps bringing up the Port Arthur massacre and it's going to be used as a political tool to further the agenda of the Australia One Party. It's going to drum up people's fear. 
their sense of helplessness, their anger and rage at the government because of what's gone on last year. Now they're going to be even more susceptible to go, this is all wrong and I'm going to sign up with the Aussie Patriots role. I'm going to vote for Australia One Party because they're offering me something different. Well, Ricardo Bossi is ex-military. And once you get to a certain rank, like he does, there is no such thing as ex-military or retired. It's just um, in reserve until you're called up again. You're never retired once you get to a certain position. So that way I look at Ricardo Bossi trying to start a party, a political party up in opposition to offer solutions to the people when he is still military. And why is he bringing up the uh, Port Arthur massacre? Again, it's to bring home, it's the event that disarmed Australians. And the thing was that when I thought about this, I thought, hmm, Ricardo Bosi could have actually been one of the special ops teams that was down there that day. And yes, I have no doubt, never did right from the word go when I first heard about it, as a bigger shock as it was, and I'll share that story in a sec, that Martin Bryant did particular things that day, but what he was supposedly said to have done in Port Arthur, I didn't there was just something wrong with it right from the word go. And anything that I did look into it only confirmed the fact that, look, it's another one of those events, isn't it? Like 9-11, not like the New Zealand shooting and all the shootings in America. There's the official story and there's the conspiracy theories. And no one's ever going to really know the truth 100% because the official narrative is not going to change. So no matter how much truth and information you bring out, it's not going to change the official narrative. All you can do is educate people on the possibility that this is how the event happened so that they become more wise to the ways of the world. So back in the 80s, I was living in Hobart. I just moved out of home and gone into my own flat. And that didn't work out. I moved in and shared with someone else. And that didn't work out too. Because, you know, you, you take up a position as a flatmate with people that aren't even settled. They move. You have to move. But anyway, I ended up meeting someone, falling in love. I ended up getting engaged too. And I moved down to the Tasman Peninsula, down to this area down here. I even worked at the Port Arthur pub for, well, about 18 months, I think. And how I got the job there was even a funny story, one I'm not going to tell you now. It, yeah, I don't want to make it a, a mile long, this video. I lived in various places. I lived up at Eagle Hawk Neck, um, on this side, on the other side of the neck, behind the Lufra. Lived up at the Cunha shop, the old Tirana post office, along here in Tirana, um, yeah, up at Peter's Walls. <laughs> lived in quite a few different places, and I only lived down there a couple of years. But um, I worked for a large amount of the time at the Port Arthur pub. I did work for a short amount of time at the Lufra pub, but... Um, my time down at Port Arthur was event field. I had several car accidents. Uh, let's see, I hit a tree just outside of Port Arthur here, coming down here. Came around that corner. Uh, came down here. Lost, uh, don't know what happened. Uh, I hit a tree. Head on with the tree. I uh, hurt myself pretty badly with that, broke a few things and yeah, never actually went to the hospital and when I did go to the hospital weeks later there wasn't much they could do, I just had to finish healing. Coming around that same corner too, one night after I had left work at the pub, 
coming out of there, driving up round, the bonnet flew up on the car. Another accident I had was um, going up to town one day, the steering didn't work and I went, well, I couldn't turn round a corner, I ended up sideways, squashed down in a ditch between a concrete pylon and a tree. You know, so many of these accidents that I lived through that, uh, you know, still surprised to this day how I lived through it. Uh, what else happened? Oh, that's right. Um, the wheel fell off the car. <laughs> but that, that was just the car accidents. There was also the one about where I'm left-handed and I damaged my left arm and, yeah, complete, did nerve damage that has completely severed certain nerves on my left hand and it's affected me ever since. I used to play the piano before then and I can't lift my fingers up so I can, yeah, it's not fun to try and play the piano. <laughs> so needless to say, Port Arthur, in the what two years I was down there, held a lot of varied lessons. And in the end, when I was working down at the Port Arthur pub one day, I was watching the same local wait for me to open up the pub at 11 o'clock. Uh, he was one of the groundsmen there and he'd come in, done his work, and he was waiting for the bar to open so he could have his beer. And I just looked at him sitting up the end of the bar there like I had so many other days before, wondering if I was going to get any more customers that day like so many other days, you know, it's so quiet and boring. And then it just hit me, is this what I want for the rest of my life? This, you know, this that was boring, that looking at the face of an alcoholic that, yeah, he was a good alcoholic, he had a job at least, <laughs> but is this what I was looking at, my future? of doing the same thing and it's so boring. So pretty much after that, I quit my job and I said to the guy that I was engaged to, we were having a rocky relationship at that stage, I'm heading to um, Melbourne, off to WA, do you want to come? And he said, no, not really. <laughs> so I went and pretty much, you know, I have spent most of my adult life living on the mainland and well just I just had another birthday and <laughs> yeah getting closer to 60 now not 50 <laughs> and uh, yeah I've had what 80 different addresses I've lived and experienced a lot of different things but by far Port Arthur was the hardest lessons the, uh, the most physically hardest lessons I had to learn. So it, it kind of, um, when the Port Arthur massacre happened, uh, I, I lived in the area. I, I mean, when I wasn't working, well, I, when I wasn't busy in the pub, sometimes you just go out into the lounge bar and you just stare out. They had huge, well, they still do, have huge glass windows and you just stare out onto the the ruins and still at that stage too you can drive down there there's no toll booth or anything although there was talk of that starting to happen it wasn't anything and even when it was open you know very few of the locals actually went down there there were times that I would go down there after work simply because nobody else went there it was so quiet See, the whole Tasman Peninsula, there are so many better places to actually go have a party, make your party. You don't need to go down to the ruins where there's a lot less. It's more lit up, you can't light your fire, you know, you can't paddle in the water because there's a big, big brick wall and, you know, I don't know where about security cameras back then, but, you know, someone would have been watching it. So, you know, most people didn't act most locals didn't actually go to the Port Arthur area so when you have someone like 
Martin Bryant that lived at Copping and he goes down to Roaring Beach which is over out of Newbina here. Let me take you out a little bit there. Over here at Newbina, this little tree over here is Roaring Beach. And that's a, that's a pretty sandy road. Now I don't want to get too much into the events of that day or whether Martin Bryant was innocent, guilty, whether he did it alone or he had others. I actually think that he was part of an operation. He was the scapegoat, uh, had no idea what was going on in Port Arthur. I do believe that there's a lot that we will never, never have the official story tell us the truth over. So for the amount of how much research people do and how much they prove one way or the other, it's not going to change the official narrative. And it's not going to change the position for the people that died or for Martin Bryant that is taking responsibility for many more deaths than he actually did. But that's just my opinion. But the day that um, my mum rang up, I can't forget it because I was living in Queensland at the time. I'm pregnant with my first child. It's my stepfather's birthday. And mum rings me up because they had been to Newbina that day to play tennis. And they were going to go down to the Broad Arrow or maybe the Fox and Hounds after the, the tennis. But they got tired, so they went home. But why mum rang me was because my stepfather's birthday, with the day they were down at Newbina, was the 28th of April 1996. They were actually playing tennis in Newbina. When Martin Bryant is, well, he's either at Roaring Beach, coming back from Roaring Beach, uh, but they're down there the same time. And that day they had planned to actually go, as I said, down here to the Broad Arrow Cafe or just along here to the Fox and Hounds. But they had had a hard day with the tennis, so they decided rather than go out the Port Arthur way, they'd just go straight back out Cunha and turn off at Tirana. And they went home. Now, as they got to Tirana, she noticed there was a bit of activity going on, my mum. And the thing being that if they had probably been, you know, five, ten minutes longer, they would have been shut down uh, as part of the lockdown on the peninsula. So she was coming out as things are starting to come in from... Well, you know when there's activity. I mean, you hit this straight in here. It's local traffic or tourists. And when you start seeing cops flying along the road and, you know, their sirens are going and stuff like that, you wonder what the hell's going on. And that's what Mum thought. She didn't know until she got home and it's unfolding what's hap happened at um, Port Arthur. But the whole reason that I'm bringing all of this up is because it is bothering me that Max Egan and Ricardo Bosi are going to use the Port Arthur massacre as a political tool, as a way to, well, I suppose direct um, anger and agitate anger. I mean, if you look at, I mean, the techniques that they use to train ISIS and other terrorist groups. They go, um, first of all, for the young disgruntled youth, which is, for the majority, the males. They are angry and they are looking to um, justify that anger in some way, to have a go at somebody. So when you have someone like Max Egan and Ricardo Bosi that bring up, you know, oh, you're helpless, even more helpless now, uh, to drum home the fear, to escalate the fear levels in the young males especially. 
to get them into a mindset to follow the directions of those that first brought out all this enlightening stuff to them like they are some kind of messiah that made some unique revelation rather than merely people that are talking about things that have been said by others and quite frankly I've watched Max Egan's documentary on 9-11 it is not a good video I don't think it's a good video at all and that's just my opinion Michael Moore's 9-11 um, documentary was much better So what Max Egan's going to do on the Port Arthur Massacre and the New Zealand shooting shootings is to do documentaries on them, to take all the video clips and research and to narrate a version of what he believes is the events and giving reasons why these events are false flags in the sense that they are not what they appear to be and he's going to offer Ford very forcefully like he said that with like I've seen Max Egan on the New Zealand shootings and he's basically said so many times that anyone that doesn't believe him about the narrative that he's come up with is an idiot they're a liar, a government plant, or they're trying to mislead you. Because, like, there's one thing that he said, I wish I could remember what it is now, that he said, um, oh, well, if, you know, you can't see this and it's been shown this, well, that's all your proof, you know. And it's like, that's not even proof. Yeah, you know, but I don't want to pick to pieces his lack of um, see people think that because they can come up with an idea they can go to certain things and they go oh, well that's proof that's the truth all it is is proof that you've come up with your own truth and how you've actually come to that conclusion it does not mean that it is actually the way it happened you might be close you might not be anywhere near close but with the New Zealand shooting, Max Egan got very adamant and he even was calling out um, others like PK that were bringing out information on it. So he, he was countering what was even being explored in the alternative media and then he was insisting that he knew it right and he created a great big divide in the truth of movement over that and he lost uh, quite a few friends but in the last year Max Egan has gained quite a lot of groupies more groupies as 2020 brought out all the disillusioned the newly aware people that suddenly weren't that they weren't looking at what their government was like before because it wasn't affecting them now they are looking at it because it is affecting them and they're angry and they've got well they go out looking for solutions and they find people like Max Egan and then you find people like Ricardo Bosi who are offering a political option that you know to counteract this and you've also got the great Australia party that Mark McMurtry's jumped in bed with too so there's all this political agenda that's going on and it's going on inside the what you'd call the alternative media or truthers it's all political and if you take a really good look at it it's ego there's so much ego you really need to start looking at how much these people keep focusing on the negatives you know like they they keep saying to you oh the government's going to put you in lockdown they're going to 
force immunizations on you and it's a DNA alter alterer you know there's all these things that is definitely going to be done and especially Max Egan on every show he does he he reinstills these concepts so that all his listeners get the idea that all these nasty things are coming for you. But that is only his interpretation and opinion. And the outcome of what does come for you has a large amount to do with how you actually approach the subject in the first place. Are you going to get all stirred up and angry and go out there and rebel and you know, get your pitchforks out and say, I've had enough of the government, I want to overthrow you. Or you're going to do some self-reflection and go, well, hey, you know, I haven't paid any attention to what's been going on. Maybe, just maybe, I can pay a little bit more attention, put some effort into understanding what's going on in the decisions that are made in the country where I live under those rules and it affects me. Take some responsibility and then find ways where, look, if you haven't noticed, protests are useless. They are absolutely useless because they're all structured and, you know, like back in the day when I first heard of protests, they were all illegal protests because there were no such thing as legal protests in the sense I mean, when the Greenies went and protested in the wilderness area, they didn't get permission for that because if they had gone and asked for permission, they wouldn't have got it. And this is where sometimes it is far better to do something and ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. So any protests these days, people like Max Egan that are leading these protest groups, these picnic in the park, you know, gatherings and everything. Do you not realise that all the people that would stand against the system violently are actually being identified? You are being identified merely by your presence. You understand all the facial recognition technology out there. Every single one of you that has showed up where Max Egan told you to go, they know exactly who you are and you are on a watch list. And Max Egan will stay in place when many others will fall simply for the reason that he is controlling the narrative and directing the way that people will act. Now, you can have all of these angry, upset people and, you know, you can stir them up and say, come on, let's storm Parliament House, let's tell the government, let's take them out the back and hang them, blah, blah, blah. Or you can go, well, right, that's not really going to achieve much, is it? That's just, when you, when you come with resistance, you're going to meet resistance. It's cause and effect. I mean, duh. So how do you actually approach something so that it will actually bring about a change? Well, the only way you can do that is to sit down at the table and talk about it. But to talk about what? What do we need to change? I think one of the core things that we need to change is the role of our politicians. And the almost celebrity status that they give themselves in that their ego out, outweighs the job. Our politicians need to be humble and they need to actually do the job we elect them to do. Serve the people and serve the people's wishes. They are our representatives and if you take a good look at government. They are our representatives. We, all of us, have let this get to this stage. Fighting ourselves is not going to change that. We need to change who we have as politicians. We need to change the criteria of the politician the motives and 
the political agendas. They all have political agendas. They all run on, I'll do this for you because that other person isn't. And it seems like Ricardo Bossi is going to run on the, I don't agree that we're, we've been disarmed and we've been made helpless and I've served inside the military so I can tell you that these things go on and when I tell you that you've got a reason to be scared, you've got a reason to be scared and you should trust me because I've been inside the system and I know how it works and I know how I can fight it and I know how I can achieve things. Well, Ricardo Bossi, military, retired, ex, not so much so. Not so much so that any second he could get recalled to duty. He has confidence, confidences, national security clearance, I dare say too. He could well know exactly what happened down at Port Arthur that day, as I said. He may have been there. He may have been part of the people that trained the people that were there. He could have been involved. So to bring up the subject of how, you know, he's now going to use it as a platform, you need to look at the people that are going to represent us. Their history. We need to actually be a little bit more discerning, a little bit more judgmental of other people. Would you vote for Max Egan? You couldn't even vote for Max Egan because Max Egan could never go on the ballot. Max Egan doesn't actually exist. He's a character that's been created. So you could never have Max Egan in any political party. But then why would you want to? You have a man that cannot even represent himself, hides everything about his true identity and life, says he has a life, but he can say whatever he wants because nobody can prove him any different because Max Egan isn't a real person and what he says is his history is only the history of his character. And these are the sorts of people that are directing a large number of disgruntled voices in Australia right now. Directing you to your little patriot role groups and your free man and sovereignty things and, oh look, we've got to escape the system and we can do this through common law and we can do that and we can, you know, we can change it all. No, you can't. You can try, but you're just going to beat your head against a brick wall. It will not achieve anything. And that's actually the design of it, to waste your time and effort chasing pointless pursuits. They won't bring about anything good, but you could end up in jail, you know. (laughs) There could be nasty shit that happens to you. And all because of your approach, that if you thought about it right from the word go, it's not going to work. So you don't do something that's not going to work. You think and you look for a way that will work. And don't tell me that we can't sit down at the table as human beings and start to change the way that we do things. Piece by piece, we can do that. How, you ask? By sitting down at the table. I can go into my politician right now. I know that um, Andrew Wilkes is, um, well, I suppose you could call him the whistleblower of the politicians. He's he's always giving all the others. He doesn't let them sweep anything under the carpet. Now, you see, Andrew Wilkie is kind of more the politician that you want. Someone that is in there for the right reasons and has got a a degree of honesty and integrity and is actually trying to achieve something for the betterment of people. 
He's not in there to make a name for himself, to get a cushy job, to, you know, big note himself, to increase his ego, to increase his wealth. He's there to make a difference. And that's where we need to elect people that only make a difference. And we need to tweak a few of the rules. Raise the bar a bit. Have a <laughs> a mental health requirement that someone that goes into politics has got certain moralistic values that has had a psychiatric evaluation done on them and they are more an empathetic person than a capitalistic self-serving person. So to have the requirement to be a politician, to not be someone that is so egotistical, but someone that is more considering of other people. Not so much self, but selfless. And that's not to say that in being selfless you completely ignore yourself. That's where these people that's... You know, when my kids were teenagers, it used to really shit me because of they were being trained in the schools of this me, 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 I, 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 I count for everything, the world revolves around me attitude. It was just everything I could to actually tell them, oh, stop buying the bullshit they're selling you. The world does not revolve around you and your damn rights. You know, you have to fit in with the rest of everybody. You know, you train a whole generation to think my rights are the most important. All of them are individuals, selfish individuals, with no concept of community, of group, because it's all about their rights, not the rights of others. And then you get the PC generation coming through where, well, now it's all about the rights of people that I've got a mental health condition, I can't decide whether I'm female or male, and I'd like you to call me they. So, yeah, this is the kind of useless pursuits that they have distracted people with and has wasted so much time. Just like rerunning events that cannot be changed. The events of the past cannot be changed. None of them. No matter how much you wish or <laughs> desire for it to be different. Whether what you understand is a true narrative or a false narrative. It's not going to change what happened in the past. It can only change what you do now. Don't let Max Egan and Ricardo Bosi stir the fear up. You know, call them out for what they are. They are controlling the narrative and heading people into... Well, could you imagine if Ricardo Bosi and Max Egan and the Aussie Patriots role get what they want and they get 20% sign up for a lawful rebellion? Then what? What they're saying is that they're going to use that to overthrow the government. The 20% are going to overthrow the 80% because they have been drummed up through fear, helplessness and guided towards that direction as being the only solution. Now, any thinking person out there knows that if something like that happened, that is just going to make things so much worse. It will not solve anything. So the ideal is to not have that situation occur. And I could stick my head in the sand and go, well, it's never going to happen. But these people are public voices. They are controlling a large number of people and directing them in a certain direction. It is well within the capabilities 
of Max Egan, Ricardo Bosi, Mark McMurtry, and the Great Australia One, uh, the Great Australia Party, to actually get enough people to sign up on that lawful rebellion. And Australians, we are just going to have one hell of a problem on our hands. You thought that dealing with the way that we've got problems, yeah, we need to fix government. There's a lot of issues we need to look at. But I tell you what, a lawful rebellion would be like a coup. That is civil rebellion. And when that happens, that is half the destruction. That is society falling apart. It's coming unglued with the people. We can't let that happen. We can't come unglued. We need to look at where we are going in 2021. And it is not towards a lawful rebellion where 20% will overthrow our government and do who knows what. I couldn't, oh, I couldn't begin to imagine the nightmare scenario that they would want to implement as their way of, well, let's give everyone sovereignty and turn everyone into free men. Or as Max Egan says, anarchists, no rulers. So if everybody has no rulers, there are no rules other than the one you make up. That means that we are lawless. We're in chaos. Now, we don't need any more chaos. So anyone that knows people that are Max Egan fans and, oh, we've got to protest and we've got to go out and picnic in the park and all this other stuff, there are better ways to achieve things than to actually come out in the open and state that you are a threat. You go to these events, you are on a list now. If you don't think you are, you are stupid. I mean, you talk about all these people, talk about conspiracy theories and all the, the false flags and everything. But yet, what, you don't think that all those cameras that are ordinarily in place around in the streets aren't doing the facial recognition. They let you come. They let you gather so they know who you are, who to monitor, who would come against the government. If you don't show up, they don't know who you are. They don't know how you would come against them if you would come against them at all. But the second you show up, you've, um, you've sealed your own fate. You, you, you know that. If you're actually thinking about it, you know that. So I think I might leave my... <laughs> another short, long video, eh? It's just a... Well, this thing about the Port Arthur Massacre and the New Zealand shootings that Max Egan's going to bring up. There's only one purpose in doing it. And it's all for Max Egan's gain. You know, his purpose, political agenda, so that he can then become, oh, look, another, oh, he's just such a great researcher. You know, actually, researchers actually find out things that people don't know. Um, parrots um, actually repeat what other people have researched and found out. You might do some what you classify as research to sift through everybody else's research to put it together to then write a story that you can narrate and become famous on my videos because, oh, look, Max Egan does a video on... Uh, the, the Port Arthur Massacre, ah, it's going to go big. He does it on the New Zealand shooting, it's going to go big. And he's going to do them because he's not on YouTube, he's on BitChute, protected by his mate Ray Vey, you know. But then again, I think BitChute's got its own problems. Yeah, I'm glad that I stopped uploading because it was getting frustrating to actually try and upload a video 
you'd sit there sometimes for 12 hours and it still hasn't, you know, fine, mixed for public, well, finished so that it's published. And sometimes it wouldn't even publish it. It would just lag and you'd have to redo it again. So it could take a day or so just to upload a video. And I think it's only got worse. It uh, When I went and had a look before on BitChute, it's actually lagging now on even trying to open up the comments in the section. So there's a lot of issues because they actually had to change their server. And, uh, yeah, I don't think BitChute's one of those long-term channels or long-term what would you call them, providers of alternative. But for the time being, they do actually let BitChute keep going because that's where all the radicals put all their stuff because they get it taken off YouTube. So it's a good place to look for all the radicals where they think they're not getting monitored because BitChute isn't monitored. Well, Ray Vey may not monitor but it doesn't mean that the public can't. Anything that's on the internet and accessible is monitorable. I can monitor anything I want on BitChute. I can research, check out, look, hunt, search, do all I want and find out information and slowly gather a report of information. You know, the increase in subscribers, the increase in dislikes to likes ratio, more people posting negative comments. What? Like, you look at someone like Max Egan or anyone on BitChute or anywhere, what do people comment on? Max Egan <laughs> is very selective about what he comments on. And it's also very indicative of what he finds pertinent to comment on. See, I'll comment on anything because I look at it as, well, someone's just made a comment to me, I'm going to answer them back whether they like it or not. But most people would actually choose, um, no, I'm going to ignore that comment, no, I'm going to ignore, oh, look, I like that one. Thank you, I like that. Thank you for saying I'm such a nice person and, and you worship me. Yeah, here, donate here. Oh, look at this one. This one's putting me down. Oh, I'm going to tell them off. I'm going to call them all the names under the sun. I mean, you know, Mark McMurtry and Max Egan actually have got the same kind of style where they think that if they can call people enough names, that will make them right. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to leave it now with the warning. Do not be drawn up in the fear of what Ricardo Bosi and Max Egan are going to bring out about the Port Arthur massacre and the New Zealand shootings and give you that sense of helplessness. You are not helpless. None of us are. Trust me, I would never have got a gun anyway, so, you know, taking the guns away made no difference to me but I am by no means helpless. I've got two bats, and I tell you what, people would actually wish that I would learn how to shoot and give them a bullet in the kneecap to disarm them rather than go through the pain of what they would encounter with my bats. And given the scenarios I envisage myself that I would need to use that, it's going to be dark and I'm going to have the upper hand because, you know what, I'm half bat. You know, I can see in the dark. In fact, I can actually see in the dark better than I can in the daylight, which, yes, for my whole life I have to wear sunglasses. I am light sensitive. So very easy to see in the dark, very easy to sneak up on people too. <laughs> so many people ask me, can you just make a noise before you... You sneak up on us, you scare the shits out of us. So, yeah, sometimes I will, <clears throat> or <laughs> I will actually deliberately tread on something I know will make a noise. So, or put my feet down heavy. I'm just used to moving through the environment in certain ways. It's not sneaky, it's just 
yeah, me. And if other people are deaf, well, I can hear myself moving. <laughs> I've got sensitive hearing too. And smelling. Yeah, too many sensitive senses. Anyway, that's a heads up warning on Port Arthur. Don't get drawn into the fear that's going to be created once Max Egan brings that out. And try and keep the uh, impressionable young hotheads under control and not off the <laughs> let's overthrow the government bandwagon. There's really no good will come from overthrowing our government. We know that. We know there's problems. But overthrowing the government is um, just going to make those problems oh so oh so much worse, so much more unachievable to try and fix anything once it's kind of like broken beyond repair. If something like that does happen, we will, you know, you're heading in towards civil war, and you don't want that. So anyway. I've said my piece. <laughs> now I'm going to get back to all my evidence gathering. Anyway, I'll catch you on the next video. Bye.